Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Kevin Glass, director of outreach and policy at the Franklin Center for Government and Public Integrity. So I guess let me start by just asking what is the Franklin Center? What do you guys do over there? Sure. Uh, a lot of people actually I think are under some – Wrong impressions about it. It sounds like a think tank. It looks like a think tank. What it really is is uh, it's an organization that funds a lot of citizen journalists across the country um, and professional journalists for that matter. So it's almost like a – more in the vein of a ProPublica or uh, any other public interest uh, nonprofit journalism organizations that you may know may be more prominent. Um, but it focuses mostly and primarily on state issues. So we have a large group of journalists across the country in 24 different – living and working in 24 different states as a matter of fact and not only in you know, the ones that are going to garner the biggest headlines. So we don't have any you know, Albany-based based journalists reporting on New York State. Uh, we largely don't have reporting on California, although we dabble in it sometimes. So we have a lot of journalists in Idaho, in Tennessee, in Alabama, in Mississippi, um, some of the lesser known, lower profile uh, states where a lot of you know, there aren't a lot of – there's not a lot of reporting on it. There's not a lot of news coming out of there. Um, but we do think that a lot of the things that affect people's lives the most come out of your state houses, come out of county courthouses, um, come out of school boards. So we're trying to get journalism that is closer to the people, um, that doesn't necessarily make Brian Williams on the nightly news headlines, um, but is still incredibly important and affects people's lives. So are these journalists talking to a national audience in the way that say ProPublica is or are they writing for local – Publications, because I can imagine the school board may be important to a small group of people, but the interest Not to the is the Washington Post. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> right. Well, uh, they're writing for Watchdog.org, which is a pro primarily, uh, which is a product of the Frank, not product, uh, uh, sub umbrella organization of the Franklin Center. Um, but we do have people writing in other outlets, uh, trying to reach a wider audience. So it's kind of both in-house writing and pitching out to other organizations, particularly on issues that are going to affect people and draw eyeballs in from a national audience. So for example, you know, and this is something that hits m more people and more of the national audience. Uh, we had a very long series on Terry McAuliffe uh, recently exposing some of his cronyism, exposing some of his corruption, exposing some of his ties to uh, actually Hillary Clinton and, you know, names like that garner eyeballs. They get excitement on the national level. Um, but they're also, you know, reporting on the Richmond State House when all eyes aren't on the Richmond State House. Uh, so it's kind of an all the time thing. And when it bubbles up to the national level, we'll try and get more um, eyeballs there. But you know, it, that's not always happening, and yet still, some of those issues are affecting people on a daily basis. Now, I assume that one of the theories behind uh, uh, the Franklin Center and the project here is that exposing government as government can do a lot of bad things in the shadows, right? And state governments seem particularly prone to being kind of insane or at least the kind of laws we hear introduced occasionally. Right. Do, is that what they're, they're exposing this? They're looking into this? They're providing a service from a conservative libertarian standpoint? Right. Well, it, it kind of falls in the conservative libertarian umbrella um, just because, yes, it, we're about exposing corruption, we're ex about exposing cronyism, or about exposing local governments doing things that sound like they're insane, like they – that they're things that government shouldn't be doing. Um, but our reporters, they're not ideological. We hire them because they're good reporters. They're good at investigative journalism. Um, so – and I think actually it's something that – this is a trans-ideological issue is that progressives, liberals don't want government to be corrupt because they want government to be good and government to be efficient. Uh, conservatives don't want – government officials to be corrupt because they want to use this as an example of why government shouldn't be doing thing X at all because all bureaucrats are corrupt or whatever. Um, so it's more of a, you know, we are exposing some of these issues uh, and our reporters aren't particularly ideological themselves. Um, but we do kind of get shoehorned onto the right because um, it is often on issues that uh, kind of – 
cross against some progressive ideals. So, you know, we do saw, we have an energy reporter who reports on cronyism in the green energy sector, um, which you would think, you know, you don't want cronyism going on. Um, although that, I guess, maybe some people a, might actually want cronyism going. I mean, the government might be funding these things right, to right. create solar panels and things like that. So that there might, might be some people who want it's, that. It, if I were to be a progressive apologist, I suppose you you would say you have to get in bed with big corporations sometimes to get your progressive goals. Investing in America's energy future. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the word. Yeah, that's investing. Word. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so maybe there is an ap apology case to be made there, but still, generally, you talk to an average progressive, a grassroots progressive. They don't want uh, government getting in bed with big businesses, especially. Sitting inside the beltway as we are right now, it it may be difficult to imagine how state and local governments can be as threatening, if not more threatening, to their citizens as the federal government is. I mean, the federal government is this enormous entity that does, I mean, unfathomable number of things, most of them awful, and the state governments are so much smaller. So. And some of them even meet intermittently, like the half-time legislators and things like that. Uh, so how much, so what, how much of a danger exactly? Yeah. One of the things that uh, – and I covered national politics uh, previously and one of the things that is important and, and draws eyeballs like I've been talking about is the, the amount of money thrown around at the federal government is just astounding. It's billions and billions of dollars and if I think of $1 billion in the context of my own life, I'm like, oh my god, that is – so much money, I can't believe it. But it's like on, you know, certain government programs, they're wasting billions of dollars a year. So that obviously has an effect on people's lives. But you know, at the local level, some of the things that affect you on a day-to-day -day basis that you might not even think about. So we've been doing a series on um, in different states uh, trying to reform some of their alcohol licensing laws. And that affects if on your drive home, you can pick up a handle of Jack Daniels at the supermarket or you got to drive out of your way to a state-owned liquor store. You know, And that's not – maybe that doesn't seem like a huge deal but on a day-to-day -day basis, the amount of things that are happening at the local level that actually affect your life, um, I believe and I, um, I think that a lot of our reporters would back me up is – it does affect you more than the federal government wasting ten billion dollars on solar panels. These things add up too. People, you, you don't often don't see those little oppressions where you realize that you can't buy beer, or you can't buy beer on Sundays, or you can't get in a certain location, or all these other different things. It seems like though, if you think about the founders and the Constitution, you know, they kind of had an idea, at least on partially, that that one of the reasons they didn't want to give that much power to the federal government is because people weren't going to be very good at knowing what the federal government was doing versus knowing what their state governments are doing. Now it seems like people just look at the federal government and ignore the state governments because I'll, I'll get calls here to Cato that ask me about, you know, why aren't you guys doing anything to stop this? You know, this, the federal government's doing this to me and I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure that's your state government. So the whole thing might have been flipped on its head from what the founders originally thought. Right. I'm, and I don't know founders' intent here and that could have been one of the motivating factors. But obviously in the mass communications age, it's not hard to know what the federal government is doing even if you're out in Idaho or Wyoming or something like that where it would take days to send a letter. You get uh, CNN on your TV. You get Cato on your internet. You, know? um, you have smartphones. You have email. You have all sorts of means of communicating – mass communication with – the state gov – well, with your state legislator in uh, Washington. So – and I do think that that's kind of nationalized politics. Well, I think it has definitely nationalized politics to a large extent in that saying, you know, why, why should Vermont push for single-payer health care when we can all get together and push for single-payer health care uh, in Washington, D.C. at the federal level? Um, so maybe – to a certain extent, that's why – well, that, I think that is why people are focusing a lot more on the federal government um, because it's easier to. Um, but it doesn't mean that a lot of those state functions have gone away. It, mean, um, it might just mean that they're being overlooked and to a certain extent, that's unfortunate. And I think that a lot of people need to be more cognizant of what's going on both at their state and their local level. I'm also inclined to think that I mean it seems a lot of the attention that people pay to politics is as kind of a spectator sport, right? It's 
it's fun, or I guess some people find it fun. I don't, I don't quite fathom why, but some people you're find in the it, wrong city. Aaron. <laughs> some people find it fun to follow politics and see what politicians are up to in kind of a gossip mag sort of way, um, and and I wonder if you know the the competition that the multiple media sources and the internet have brought. You, know, you need to draw. You're competing with more outlets. You need to draw a wider range of interests in the federal government impacts all of us and if it ends up looking like you know the way that people tend to watch major league baseball far more than they watch you know minor league or little league even though it's happening closer to home and so i wonder if part of it is like trying to figure out how to make local politics more interesting so people will will engage with it you know to cut against the the pros Right. I I think that it just seems more like um, you have a bigger team, right? If you're rooting for Team R uh, at the st- at the state level, at your local level, at your county level, you've only got a couple thousand, a couple hundred, a couple dozen people on your team, um, and those dozen people aren't all that active on Twitter. They don't in, uh, engage with you on Facebook. They're not really getting together for little meetings. Uh, well, they might be. Um, but at the national level, obviously, your team is millions and millions and millions of people. And so I think to a certain extent, it's kind of a desire to belong to a team. And I think mass communication in this area is helping to polarize us um, in that you can stay in your house all day. And I don't want to <laughs> fall into the cliche of being like those bloggers on their mother's couches. They never leave the home. But it, 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 it's a way of connecting you with like-minded people and being able to galvanize your like-minded people, um, not only in your community but across the country. So uh, in your community, people might not think that Common Core, for example, is a great idea and they're not going to institute it at your local school board. That doesn't mean that you can't call your buddy over in Nebraska and say, hey, here's this idea that I think we need to push and maybe not at the state level, but we can get enough people, uh, get enough of a movement to make a difference at the federal level, um, which I think is a really weird and backwards way of considering our politics that you can create a large enough coalition to move the federal government but not your own state government. Well, it is interesting. Attention might be a rare commodity in the sense that we put all this stuff in Washington, D.C. and people come here and they join and they join whatever element they're going, lobbying, the Hill, the punditocracy, the shouting shows, any of a those things. A think tank. A think tank, yes, any of those things. But then with all this focus of activity, we still don't have enough attention that's even paid on Washington, D.C., it would seem. There are so many things that happen in the shadows and I don't mean like smoky rooms where they make deals, which I'm, I'm sure exist, but just things like U.S. agricultural policy, which no one really wants to pay that much attention to and so they, they kind of ignore it because it's like reading printed chloroform if you try and read U.S. agricultural policy. And again, like maybe we're just putting too much into Washington and for even the attention of this town to actually pay enough attention to check government adequately. Right. Well, the federal government's power to tax is immense. So like I said, the amount of money being thrown around at the federal level is just, is mind-boggling. And like you said, you know, U.S. agricultural policy makes no sense whatsoever and there's so much money invested in it. Um, but the stakeholders themselves, the factory farmers, even the quote-unquote small farmers have so much invested um, that it's hard to get a broad-based coalition to overcome the people who actually have an interest and a stake in agricultural policy. Um, and there's some interesting work that's been done on – that because the sums of money are so large and I don't remember which economists are working on this but that large corporations are actually underinvesting in lobbying uh, if you judge by the amount of quote unquote return on investment that because there's so much money at stake they could be actually doing more to get a piece of pieces of those pies um, and it might eventually reach a, a point where uh, we're at a kind of balance of lobbying and that lobbying becomes less effective because more people are investing in it. But you're right to a certain extent that uh, there isn't enough attention paid to certain amounts of federal policy. But to a certain extent, I think you know it's hard to get a broad-based coalition to say we need to end corn subsidies because it's hard to see how that affects you as a 
as an individual who lives in, let's say, Chicago um, rather than a farmer who lives in Nebraska. You need so much energy on the part of people who don't really have a stake in it other than a couple bucks in their uh, tax return every year. So it, it, it's hard to say that there's not enough attention being paid to the federal government when that is – all were bombarded by on you know national level news, um, but to a certain extent, you are right that some of the weeds of federal policy still have a lot of sunlight that need. Um, well, it seems that way. On like, I mean, just as sort of going off that point on the shouting shows, Rachel Maddow is probably not going to have a ten minute segment on corn subsidies. She is going to have a ten minute segment on. A crazy law introduced by a legislator in Indiana, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which is not crazy, but like for example, she's going to have Tim in a segment on that, which affects far fewer people than corn subsidies. But it's just not that interesting. So maybe on <clears throat> when we look at the state side, we can start saying, well, people can start focusing on these things and actually working with government better right. than sitting in this town and just yelling at each other for a very right. long time. And like I said, it's easier to point to someone and say, hey, if uh, Virginia sells off all their liquor stores. You can buy your your liquor in Harris Teeter or Giant or whatever. Um, then to say, hey, if you and a bunch of other you, of your fellow citizens get together and come to Washington, you can save five bucks on your tax return because we won't be sending money to Iowa for corn subsidies. You know, um, I think it's easier at the state level to point out how things are actually going to affect people's lives, uh, even when. And this is the hard part. They're not as invested and obviously it doesn't take up time on the shouting shows. It doesn't take up time on Twitter or on social media or um, wherever else they might get their news. Trevor mentioned the hypothetical local lawmaker making the crazy law and that makes me – Hypothetical, yes. Uh, well, no, <laughs> like, uh, because one of the things you notice in kind of these – national stories of outrage about something that some lawmaker did is that the really crazy stuff um, seems to happen at in state legislatures. And I, I worked for – I interned for a little while during um, – between college and law school in the legislature in Colorado and there were quite a few just outright lunatics who had been elected. Um, and so I'm – is that is – that, are people crazier? At the state level, is it is it easier to get nuts elected than you know at the national well, level? People are less professional at the at the state level, um, so it is. And to a certain extent, this is charming to a lot of people, and this is why some legislators get elected. Is that it's like uh, the guy next door to you. He he's a he turns out to be a state legislator, and he's got some really crazy ideas on uh, you know trash pickup in the neighborhood or something like that, and how he wants to nationalize trash pickup. Let's say I don't know something like that. Um, but it also they have this affectation and. I don't mean to be someone who's coming off like an East Coast cosmopolitan here, but people have an affectation that gets them elected there. And to a certain extent, it's just supply and demand. There needs to there's a demand for far, far, far more legislators at state and local levels um, than 500 people on Capitol Hill in D.C. So you need a larger supply of people who aren't who are sometimes. Not as ambitious. They don't want to be a polished politician and not trained on not saying crazy things or whatever. Um, so to a certain extent, yes, people are less well thought out uh, on at the state level. But that's not to say that uh, there's still not good things that are happening at the state level. So you guys at the Franklin Center are hiring journalists to – cover these stories that you say aren't getting enough coverage, covering these topics that aren't getting enough coverage. Wasn't that – especially that kind of covering the, the local issues, that the dream of internet-enabled citizen journalism? Does that play a role in this? Has, has citizen journalism kind of sputtered out if it was ever a thing? I'm, I don't know the answer to that question. I know, you know back in the days of – Blogspot and uh, early WordPress and things like that. Uh, lot there were lots of quote unquote citizen journalists working on uh, hyper local issues. Um, I think that in the age of mass communication, we've gone away from that. So 
the local blogger wants to – who's – let's say the local blogger in Florida uh, wants to blog about the Indiana RFRA – Instead of you know some small bore issue at his local level, um, because everyone wants to have that kind of national level voice, um, and I think it to a certain extent, yes, we have gotten away from quote unquote citizen journalists, um, but partly because, as you said, there's a a large number of competing news outlets now um, back. 15 years ago, there were far fewer news websites. Uh, there were far fewer uh, news cha- – TV, cable, news channels or what have you. So we have a lot more on the national level covering these things. We have a lot more news sources and a lot more news outlets. I mean when's the last time you went to like a Blogspot blog that was actually good and covering some of the local issues? Uh, that to me – and this is anecdotal. I don't have any hard – Data here. It seems like that was a relatively common thing that happened in the 2000 to 2005 era, um, and I do think that some, to a certain extent, it's gotten away from that. Not to say that there aren't still very good hyperlocal citizen bloggers, citizen journalists, um, but it does seem like blogging, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes that no one can see, as a medium has gotten away from that, um, and. In addition to that, why Franklin is the way it is is like I said, we have – our journalists are not ideologues. They're not pushing an opinion. They're not pushing a viewpoint um, and they're writing straight news stories. For the most part, they have professional journalism training. So it's kind of a way of giving an at least air of professionalism, an air of um, non-biased news source to some of these stories. Are you concerned with the death – relative death of local newspapers that – we're missing some of the sunlight, shining a sunlight onto practices of local government because these bloggers and journalists write on a national – or look more to the national level? To a certain extent, yes. Uh, the the dying of local newsrooms um, and local newspapers um, – Definitely means that there are issues that are affecting, like I like I've said, affecting people's lives on a day to day basis that aren't getting covered all that much. But I do think, to a certain extent, that is, and I, I'm a very large believer in supply and demand of journalism itself. It's also the fault of the news consumers at those levels. They they are not interested, for the most part, in some of that journalism. Um, we want to make them interested. It's not easy to do that. Um, so it means that, yes, there might be stories that are being undercovered, but uh, it's also the fault of some of those newspapers for not covering them in a way that does interest those people, for covering, um, you might say, the wrong stories or having the wrong beats, uh, things that don't affect people's lives. So to a certain extent, yes, we're going to miss some of that, but. It really needs to be the job of news producers to be able to engage the citizens on that level. When we had been emailing prior to the show, going over what we would talk about, you had mentioned to me that this this divide between what goes on at state and local levels and what should go on and at the federal level was one of the reasons that you tend to think of yourself more as conservative than libertarian. Could you expand on that a bit? Sure. Um, this is not something that I have an academic philosophical justification for, but I do think that uh, the closer that a government is to its people, the more just it is. So this is maybe an explicitly anti-consequentialism argument, but I don't really care if uh, state and local governments are unlibertarian or – hostile to freedom even. Um, I, I do care that people have a stake in their government and the closer that it is, the larger – the more outsized that one individual's political influence can be uh, is more important to me than achieving libertarian-ish or conservative or freedom-loving um, ends. So for example, if I lived in Vermont, I would be super against their – Obamacare waiver uh, single payer system that they're pushing, but I don't have a problem with it on a philosophical level because within the United States, uh, there's an incredibly powerful right of exit from any state like that, any state regime like that. Um, and I think that 
that's more important, I think, than put, than just saying that we need to maximize freedom at all levels. And I know that that doesn't necessarily mean I'm not a libertarian. Um, I just believe, I guess, in democracy first and outcomes second. Um, and then why I might be a conservative is is I'm really skeptical of all regimes to get it right, including my own. So I could be very wrong about everything that I'm saying. Um, so I would prefer everything be done slower, which is the kind of classical conservative uh, temperament rather than actual philosophy. It sounds to some degree like you're describing the too often ignored third part of Nozick's Anarchy State and Utopia, his his utopia chapter where he articulates the view of the utopia of utopias where people can get together for all sorts of reasons and live all sorts of various lifestyles but the right of exit makes it – you know, where we care less about the particulars of one because if you don't like it, you can up and move to another. Right. I, I'm interested in this is something that just is – playing around in my head is uh, uh, some kind of regime where you could get a, a, a right of exit subsidy or something from the federal government um, for very poor people who can't afford to just up and move around whenever they want to find the best regime that they want to live under. Um, but I think that that's an incredibly strong uh, part of American democracy is the ability to choose where you live um, and the, obviously the freedom of labor, the f freedom of travel everywhere in the United States. Um, I would rather see – and this is again another conservative, conservative idea that I know is supported by a lot of libertarians, the whole laboratories of democracy thing that in every state uh, and preferably even at the – more local levels, you get – you can choose where you want to live and you can experiment and if some of those ideas are good, they might scale up. Um, but it's important for people to be able to vote with their feet. The exit subsidy is, a, is an interesting idea. I mean when I give, I give a talk to the interns here about the origins of political obligation and political authority if such a thing exists and in part of that, I – undercut the notion of the, the social contract being a thing um, and drawn, you know, David Hume kind of savaged the, the social contract idea with precisely this like, look, you know, the most of the people, especially in his time, were very poor, didn't have a lot of options. And so when you say things like, well, you know, by staying here, you've agreed to it, or if you don't like it, up and leave, that it's that's not a meaningful choice for them. They they simply right. don't have that option. But I'm struck that I mean we we're very far from an exit subsidy, and in fact, I mean, the United States government routinely imposes substantial exit taxes on right. anyone who would want to leave. Yeah, especially leaving the country itself, yeah, which requires paying some exorbitant amount of citizen. If you renounce your citizenship, you have to pay the government money, which is really bizarre. Even renewing my pa I'm renewing my passport right now. It's like oh, it's. What seventy five dollars? That's a lot of money to travel to yeah. another country. Yeah, exactly. In within the movement, now that we kind of got in the conservative libertarian thing, which is which is a big issue right now, and you've been working in the conservative slash libertarian movement for a while, but it's becoming more and more of a thing about whether or not you're a conservative, you're a libertarian, and the infighting within the within the two groups. Do you see that as? Is getting better, getting worse? Do you see it as a resolvable? Do you see it as an intractable difference? I guess that's like three questions all right. in one right there. Um, I'm not sure. The thing right now is that there's a Democrat who's president and what that means is that uh, Republicans become more libertarian and libertarians feel more at home in the kind of broad-based conservative movement. Uh, I'm not that old but I have a fairly good view of history and I don't think that the arrival of a Republican president into the White House would portend more harmony between libertarians and conservatives than it has in the past. Uh, so it's got – quote unquote gotten better in the Obama era because again President Obama is a Democrat and Republicans act very libertarian when there's a Democrat in the White House uh, except on foreign policy. But uh, well, even so, actually, there are more kind of Republican 
realist-ish critics of some of President Obama's foreign policies. Oh, yeah, criticizing Libya and things like this. Exactly, yeah. Absolutely, just because um, he's on the other side. Yeah, but I, I have no confidence that a Republican getting into the White House would not mean that there is – just as many bobbings or civil liberties infringements or anti-libertarian policies emanating out of Washington. And do you see – because I could definitely see conservatives pre practical – I'm putting that in scare quotes too uh, – <laughs> practical conservatives, more Republican-minded people you know, saying, well, we got the presidency now. Let's just do some things and the libertarians saying, well, we don't want to do – bad things or things that are half measures are going to have bigger problems in the future. So we could – a Republican president could exacerbate that divide possibly. Oh, absolutely. I mean look at the George W. Bush era. You know, He – I can't name a libertarian-ish policy that he passed except maybe the tax cuts which um, – maybe exactly. Um, I'm not sure any of the – Prospective Republican candidates, maybe Rand Paul, but he has some very unlibertarian uh, leanings as well. Would and I again, I think that most of the traditional Republican national issues are hostile-ish to libertarian aims. So you know, expansion of the security state, um, anti-immigration policies. Um, so I'm I I have no faith in con continued. If you can call anything that's happened in the last eight years harmony between libertarians and conservatives really lasting through an actual Republican governing majority. You – prior to your position at the Franklin Center, you were managing editor of townhall.com, which is a very large conservative publication and Town Hall publishes quite a lot of opinion pieces. And I'm wondering if you noticed – this trend, I mean, we so we can see this kind of trend of emerging libertarianism within the Republican Party or a drift in that direction. Was that something that was showing up either, you know, so established conservatives, established kind of GOP people were paying lip service to these ideas because there was a Democrat in the in the White House and it made them look less like different, more different from Obama, or was it more a, a kind of new blood coming in who had this alternate viewpoint influencing the party? I think a little bit of both. Um, there definitely are different conservatives in Washington right now than there were in the Bush era. Um, but I'm not sure that that is something that would hold in – again, in a Republican – uh, in the White House era, I think that there's a large um, there are a large number of professional political operatives who uh, want to you know there's obviously the winning versus being right argument in politics and the winning argument usually compromises the being right argument. So even if you if you're being quote unquote being right is uh, being more libertarian, they don't care. They're f happy. Uh, compromising that and especially on national security issues where it's important for conservatives and republicans to look strong and and say we're keeping America safe in, in this way and that way. Um, that is, an, is something that I see going out the window day one of a republican presidency. From a uh, political sort of voter base, voter analysis standpoint, Going forward, I, I often say that the Republican Party, just if you look at numbers and trends on some level, has to become more libertarian if, if it doesn't want to just go to complete obsolescence. Would you agree with that? I have no idea. I'm, I would probably be the worst political prognosticator in the world because I have no clue. I'm not a professional demographics analyst, um, but I also – tend to be very skeptical of my libertarian friends who make this argument that uh, being more libertarian will get you more votes because I don't think that the American populace is very libertarian at all uh, on major – on most of the – especially on most of the major issues that divide the conservative coalition and the libertarian coalition. Um, and I think – and this is just me – maybe just me projecting. I think that the issues on which you can find polling in favor of libertarianism over conservatism, that's largely people lying to pollsters. So they say, uh, you know, I want to repeal the Patriot Act 
Um, but the moment a minor terrorist at attack is to happen, uh, they will be very happy with Republican policies on un – unlibertarian Republican policies on basically anything. But what about trends like gay marriage or, or civil liberties, okay. civil justice, criminal justice yeah. reform, things that conservatives kind of led the, the, the charge on and now maybe have to roll back as people are realizing that these are not good things? Sure. Uh, on – Gay, gay marriage is a really interesting question that uh, I think will not be a question in 10 years, um, maybe even faster than that. Uh, and I used to tell all my friends who were – well, and all my friends are basically progressives. I just have progressive friends who would say, you know, how can the Republicans be so terrible on, on gay rights? And I would say, you know, that's not going to be an issue in 2030. And I was wrong. It's not going to be an issue in 2020. It's it, – and that's just going straight up going away. Um, and no one really wants to say it. None of the professional uh, conservative activists on these issues really want to say it or admit it. But it's just – it's not going to be a thing. Um, what will be interesting is a breakdown on social issues. And I know not all libertarians are uh, pro-choice but it kind of gets defined in that social issues bucket as uh, you know, libertarians are socially liberal, uh, so they're pro-choice, they're pro-gay marriage, they're pro-drugs, they're pro other things too, uh, pro-criminal justice reform. Um, but younger conservatives are are just as, if not more, pro-life than their the preceding generation of conservatives, and that goes for kind of the country at large. Um, so on on social issues. You might say it doesn't break down as cleanly as on gay marriage um, and definitely the Republican Party will ev evolve on this just as President Obama evolved on this. Uh, it will just take them 10 more years. Do you see a conservative uh, movement or possible case for rolling back or ending, ending parts of the drug war, rescheduling marijuana? Is that something you see that could possibly change within the next 10 years? Uh, I don't know about rescheduling marijuana. I think that – Certainly, there's more conservative movement in the last year, two years on a lot of criminal justice reform issues um, and they were very – a lot of conservatives were very angry at uh, President Obama's Justice Department saying we're not going to enforce federal laws in Washington and Colorado. But uh, to a certain extent, I think that was anti – just plain up anti-Obama sentiment um, and to a certain extent, I think it was uh, conservatives complaining about liberal hypocrisy and, not, and liberals not being punished for it, right, is saying that – and Obama ex executive overreach and all of that saying that, oh, they just think that they can't – they can and not enforce the laws where they want to. Um, but I have seen a lot of conservative movement um, and maybe not necessarily rescheduling marijuana but uh, – Actually, on Capitol Hill, there's been a fairly large anti-mandatory minimums uh, lobby that's propped up – that's been – that's cropped up and that is encouraging to me and I think that uh, on a, a lot of criminal justice issues, um, the 90s are gone and in the 90s, crime itself had spiked and it was this big nationwide issue and that's kind of gone out the window now um, and crime has been falling and I think that conservatives are realizing that A, the war on drugs hasn't worked and B, it's just not that big of an issue anymore. Um, so now the bigger issues – and I went to the Criminal Justice Reform Summit last week. It was really interesting. Um, Newt Gingrich was there. Um, Pat Nolan who works for the American Conservative Union was there um, and they really brought in kind of the conservative Christian perspective, um, pushing redemption narratives, saying that – uh, you know, Christians believe in redemption. Uh, conservatives should believe in redemption and second chances. So I think there's a large movement against a lot of the hard on crime policies of the 90s. Um, whether that leads to actual rescheduling of marijuana and uh, other drugs or e or other, I guess, rehabilitation measures remains to be seen. But certainly, you could say that they're pulling back from these hard, this hard on crime stance that they've had for a long time. One of the more baffling and new trends that we read about a fair amount right now, it seems to be particularly hot in the last few weeks, um, is this kind of overabundance of uh, anti-tolerance on campuses, that 
the notion that you know you should never say anything that might upset anyone and that everyone should be protected and it's kind of – it's like a rehashing in a way of the early 90s politically correct movement that, that sputtered out and now seems to have come back with a vengeance. And is that the kind of thing – I can imagine that that being the kind of thing where the backlash against that could push – given that it's mostly a movement of the political left, right, uh, could push young people towards conservatism. That they could, you know, they could be like, look, if this is what the left is, and this is just, in many cases, I mean, just off the charts irrational. That maybe the left isn't for me, or I don't want to associate with those kinds of people, and so I'm going to embrace this other narrative. Uh, again, I'm not. Well, I'm not a college student anymore, so I don't know how your your run of the mill college student thinks about these things, but. I think to a certain extent, this is a factor of the internet and of mass communication. So you can say the PC movement of the 90s died out, but now all those people who had those tendencies in the 90s can all get together on Tumblr um, and talk about you know the issues that matter to them, um, and then bubble that up into their college campuses, into their uh, you know safety counselor guidelines, things like that. Um, I don't know how much it is bothering your run-of-the-mill college student who might ordinarily line up as a progressive if not for uh, progressive speech codes on campus or things like that. It might. Um, certainly, that's an issue on which I would say the conservative coalition and the libertarian coalition are pretty firmly aligned um, in favor of not not – punishing people for certain speech violations, let's say. Um, although I will say that to a certain extent, conservatism pushes uh, kind of social pressure over government pressure, right? They say that social norms will take the place of not – of being able to do anything um, in the absence of a government mandate. So to a certain extent, the left is triumphing there. They're saying, well, we're changing the social norms. You can't say that anymore. You can't do that anymore. And all we're doing is we're publicizing it and then your employee – we're not telling your employer anything but we're publicizing that you told this horrible joke and now you're getting fired for it. And like this is a social norm. You can't do that anymore. Um, so now I, I've seen at least conservatives kind of pull back and say social norms can't be everything and like we can't – just because social norms are more important than, gov than government mandates uh, doesn't mean that all social norms are good. Um, so I think we're going to see that fight play out a little bit in the future. As for actually pushing people away from progressivism, I think it remains to be seen. I haven't seen all that much movement on that in particular. Um, so going forward with uh, youth and with local government and – different uh, changes that are happening in terms of conservatism and libertarianism. One of these terms that we hear, and I know Aaron hates it, the libertarian moment, uh, which uh, we like to use around here sometimes. Uh, do you think that there's a possible libertarian moment happening or is that all just a bunch of fluff? I think it's a bunch of fluff. Like I said, I think that most of the polling that shows the American public receptive to libertarian-ish ideas and ideals – uh, is hogwash and when it comes to actually supporting certain policies, they're going to be against it. So can you give us uh, the libertarian – something to hope for? Uh, is that, is, is that, that would be a horrible way to end the – it was just like, oh man, like uh, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's uh, people – they say they're libertarian. They're actually not. They really want command and control. They really want safety over, over liberty, which is probably true. But – but is there, a, is there a positive upside to this? Is there some, some things that we can see, some positive change? Let me see if I can ask that in a slightly different way because I think one of the things that makes it hard for one to advance any political view that doesn't fall neatly into one of the two parties and I think you're right that the Republican Party is not nearly as libertarian or drifting in that direction as one might hope. Uh, but one of those things is you're not a member of one of these two parties and people – I mean even, even independents, we know from polling data that even people who identify as political independents almost always vote like strict party right. line. There's not, there's not many truly independent people and independent voters. Um, 
and and especially at the national level, this I mean the parties are so powerful and so well organized and so good at telling you like this is us and that's them and this is what the difference is and often wildly exaggerating the difference between the policy sets of, of candidates from the two parties. But at the local level, is there more room for alternate views because the issues are smaller, because there's less money focused on it, there's less influence from the national parties, there's less of this need to maintain that narrative? Less shouting. <laughs> less shouting, but I believe we already covered more crazy. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. I mean there are some states that explicitly ban political parties and, and political identification when you're running for office. So obviously that means that it's not going to break down as cleanly as uh, it does at the national level. Um, and I think you're right there that issues don't break down all that well, uh, conservative versus libertarian in, in a lot of different uh, local levels. Uh, you look at um, and I have friends over at the R Street Institute. They do uh, urban policy and you see a lot of conservatives and progressives kind of uniting on certain kinds of urban policy like uh, rezoning, dezoning so that we can have higher density neighborhoods um, and kind of progressives acknowledging that it's the fault of government planners that we have massive roads and parking lots when we need more density or trees or, or even like things that – seem like they're traditionally on the liberal end of the spectrum, they say, well, it's because the government planners failed in these areas. Um, so yes, at a, at, to a certain extent, a lot on the local level breaks down and doesn't really fit neatly into Team R or Team D. Um, so – and I think that there's a lot of hope for that. Um, although, like I said, I do think the national telecommunications is polarizing us. Um, so even if – in certain states, you can't run as a Republican or a Democrat. It, it becomes very clear who the titular Republican or titular Democrat are. And so somewhere in there, possibly libertarian ideas can have a, a little bit of an influence. And maybe also if we shine more of a light on local government, maybe we can start realizing that government is kind of corrupt and bad in many instances. Right. Even at the state and local level. Yeah, yeah especially at the state and local level, I would say. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org. <laughs>